Our epistle reading today comes from Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 9. If you'd like to follow along in your pew Bibles, you'll find it on page 955. Chapter 4, verse 4 starts like this. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. And the God of peace will be with you. Well, our gospel reading today is from the gospel according to St. Matthew. It's from the 22nd chapter. And as Pastor Pittman had said, it is about a wedding banquet. This is another one of Jesus' wonderful stories, his parables, his mashals, as they're called in, in the Hebrew. But um, we read beginning in verse 1. Once more Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again, he sent other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, I've prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his slaves, mistreated them, and killed them. Well, the king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed the man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot, and throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. May God add blessing to the reading of his holy word. Let's pause for a moment before we reflect on this story. Oh, gracious and loving God, we thank you for this chance to gather here today, uh, for the life you've given us, the breath you've given us. Uh, when we woke up this morning and we got out of bed, God, that was a gift for you. And we thank you for this chance to worship you for it. Fill us with your grace, including your wisdom, as we seek you in your word. Uh, give us guidance that helps us live faithfully for you. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, a husband and a wife, they were getting ready to go out to dinner one evening. And uh, they put their cat out in the front yard before they were going to leave. The Uber they ordered arrived in their driveway. But just as they were walking out of the front door to get in the car, their cat 
ran back inside through the open front door. Well, the husband, frustrated, he went back in the house to get the cat, and this time to put it in the backyard so there wouldn't be a problem. The wife, in the meantime, she got in the car. But she was concerned about the safety of their home. She didn't want the Uber driver to know that the house would be empty. So she said, she told a little fib, she said, I'm sorry, sir, my husband will be right out. He's just going upstairs for one moment to say goodbye to my mother, who's in her bedroom. Well, a few minutes later, her husband arrived and he got into the car. And he said, honey, I'm sorry I took so long. That pain in the neck was hiding under the bed and I had to, I had to poke her with a plastic coat hanger to get her to come out. <laughs> <laughs> Just, oh boy, oh boy. Well, everybody's relationships are filled with interesting moments. But uh, all of these colorful details aside, what's most important about any personal relationship is why everyone's involved. Whether it's a friendship, a family relationship, or a love interest, the most important questions to ask ourselves are, is everyone involved in this relationship because they genuinely care about each other? Or is someone, or more than one person, involved only so that they can get what they want out of the relationship, regardless of how that affects others. It's important for us to ask ourselves that because it's important for us to determine why we relate to other people. Now, we relate to people in many different contexts, in professional relationships uh, and the like, and, you know, we relate for all sorts of reasons uh, in those kind of, of uh, contexts. You know, we might hire uh, someone, uh, for instance, to, you know, uh, fix our house uh, because we're interested in them fixing our house. You know, that's the primary thing. But when it comes to personal relationships, it needs to be deeper. Uh, because if we don't ultimately have people's best interest, as well as our own in mind, in these deep relationships, we can tell ourselves that we genuinely care. And we might even convince ourselves of it. But in reality, at some point, that friendship, that family relationship, that love interest will be damaged. It might even be destroyed because of that. And this, I believe, is one of the lessons that we can take away from our gospel reading today. As I mentioned before, our passage it recounts another one of Jesus' wonderful parables. It's this story we find only in St. Matthew's Gospel. And uh, like all of Jesus' stories, it's both extremely colorful and designed specifically to get under our skin a little bit. You know, to challenge us. It, it doesn't let us be entirely comfortable. Um, in the story, we've got this king who decides to host this wedding banquet for one of his sons. Now, we've talked before many times about the customs associated with ancient Israelite weddings in Jesus' society. And one of those customs involved this wedding banquet that Jesus refers to here. Remember that on the wedding day, the bridegroom and the groomsmen, they would show up at the bride's father and mother's home, oftentimes in the middle of the night, at a time unknown to the bride and her parents. So they'd surprise them in the middle of the night. And though this is something that 
might get a person shot in our society today, uh, among Jews in Jesus' society, it was all part of the ritual, all part of the wedding uh, ceremony. For after arriving, the bridegroom would then lead a procession in the dark with torches back to his family's home where the wedding ceremony would take place. They'd have the exchange of vows. And uh, after that, that's when the wedding feast would begin. And that celebration customarily lasted seven days. You know, so it was a great way to have a nice uh, vacation every time there was a wedding. And, and this is the feast that Jesus refers to here in the story. The seven-day feast. The king in the story, he invites guests, notable guests from his kingdom, friends, to attend this special event in honor of his son and in honor of his daughter-in-law, to be. So, up until this point in the story, now this is a nice, normal story. You know, it's one that would have made Jesus' original listeners, you know, smile and feel all warm inside as they remembered, you know, all of uh, the weddings that they'd attended in the past, perhaps their, their own wedding, um, you know, a nice story. But that's precisely when Jesus, as he usually does, begins tinkering with the storyline in ways that make it more unsettling, that keep people from, you know, sort of just spacing out, but force them to pay attention. He tells us that some of the invitees to this royal wedding shockingly refuse the invitation without explanation. Now, that would have been a major insult uh, in this context. But others, it's even worse. They give a pathetic work-related excuse why they can't attend. I mean, who would want to say, I'd rather go to work than have a party for seven days? You know, I mean, it's a pathetic excuse. But others of the king's friends, well, they actually kill the king's messengers. So the plot line of this story, it immediately shifts from one you'd find in one of those animated Disney movies, you know, you can take your pick. It shifts from that to a scene from, you know, Stephen King's Children of the Corn. You know, it's like, now it's a horror thing. And so, what's going on here? You know, why are all these friends of the king going to such lengths to avoid attending his son's banquet? Well, Jesus doesn't tell us. But one thing we know for sure is how little these friends must have cared about the king and his son. I mean, uh, let's face it, it doesn't get much nastier than killing someone who invites you to a seven-day party. I mean, that's low. I mean, that's like strangling Papa Smurf or something like that. It's just, it's low, which is why the king tells his servants in verse 8, the wedding banquet is ready. But those I invited did not deserve to come. So go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, the bad as well as the good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. Now, I like this Greek word that Jesus uses in verse 10. It's translated as, as bad. Okay, now, now people in Jesus' society, just as people today, can be characterized as, as bad for any number of reasons. Uh, some, uh, it's an unjust characterization. You know, but here the word refers primarily to the hardship that a person caused others. So uh, these weren't people that other people thought were bad because they didn't like, you know, uh, their personalities or something like that. The king tells his servants to gather up, among others, people who had intentionally harmed others and invite them to the wedding feast. 
which, you know, some of us, let's face it, might seem as a little strange, you know? Uh, I mean, just because your friends turn you down doesn't mean that you should then invite, you know, John Wayne Gacy, you know, or the Manson family to your party. I mean, why go to that extreme? Why not, you know, invite some other friends? But as the story continues, it turns out that the king's decision to give these troublemakers a chance was a wise one because there ends up only being one problematic person at the party. In verse 11, when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed the man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. He asked, how'd you get in here without wedding clothes, friend? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, I don't know about you guys, but that seems a little harsh, you know. Uh, I mean, you'd think that, that offering this guy a change of clothes, you know, might be more appropriate than casting him into the outer darkness because he wasn't wearing the right clothes. Uh, so what's going on here? But again, it really wasn't this guy's clothes that were the problem, see. Like the wedding ceremonies and banquets themselves, there were also well-known, cherished customs regarding dress at these ancient events. You know, these, these were things that people grew up seeing. They knew what you were supposed to wear. You know, so this guy would have known what to wear. And the fact that he chose not to is telling. You know, he might not have, have killed the king's messengers like you know, some of those other wacko guests, but his failure to dress appropriately demonstrated that he also didn't sincerely care about the king or his son. So this guy and the people who rejected the king's invitation, they all demonstrated in their own ways that their own priorities, their own happiness, whatever was going on with them was more important than the king. They were at the center of their universe even when it came to the king's banquet. They didn't care how their actions affected the king. They didn't care if it hurt his daughter-in-law or son or his feelings. You know, they supposedly shared a personal relationship with the king, but they didn't act like it. And that's why the king wasn't interested in them being at his party. And the same is true for us. See, it's only when we genuinely care about people that we personally relate to, that we'll enjoy healthy, long-lasting friendships, family relationships, and romantic relationships in our lives. Sometimes with people we'd least expect, like the bad people the king invited to his son's banquet who ended up not being so bad after all. Sometimes we enter into personal relationships with agendas. You know, we, we have things that, that we do because we're trying to work toward an end that benefits us without the other person's, you know, well-being in mind. And that's what this story is trying to protect us from. See, so many of God's richest blessings flow into our lives and then into the world through us, through the personal relationships we share with others. So the story challenges us to ask ourselves, with what spirit do I currently relate to others in my family or in my circle of friends? When all is said and done, is their well-being as important to me as mine? Amen.